Okay, let's start. Um, welcome to uh, the Service Brokers 101, that extra something. Um, the uh, conference is nearly finished now, but um, we are not finished with our stories. So uh, um, if you weren't in the getting started track until now, we're trying to get you folks with it uh, into new topics and you uh, know, not faced um, until now, or if you're new to the uh, to Cloud Foundry to get you started with the, the topics that are interesting. And this talk is um, an introduction to service brokers. So you guys get um, started with the staff and um, get to know what a service broker is, what it's doing for me, and uh, why should I use that, and what's the interest in, in that topic. So let's start. Uh, first of all, my name is Christian Brigger. Um, I'm working with Evola. Um, we're a systems integrator, and um, we're uh, very much into service brokers, so that's why I'm here. And I'm also an, an ambassador. So if you're around, have questions, we have these things here, uh, these batches, you see the uh, Cloud Foundry ambassadors. If you have questions to anything about Cloud Foundry, reach out to us, ask us. Um, we are also every, at every conference, so you can also see us at the uh, European uh, Summit, and we always will have some batch on us. So feel free to ask us uh, about anything about Cloud Foundry. Uh, at least we will send you out to the guys who have the most specific answers, because we know them. So service brokers. What's Cloud Foundry about? Um, Cloud Foundry is about shipping your app. So you want to ship your app, you see if push it, you're fine with it, it's cool, it's running, I don't have to care how it's deployed, and, and that's cool. Um, this is Bob, he has shipped his app. He's cool with it. Um, now he, he wants to make his app even better. Um, but what he gets from Cloud Foundry is he's now a prod and dev parity because he can make several spaces, push his app to these several spaces, and has by that a staging concept, which makes the, the switch from a development perspective to a production really easily. Um, he can scale his app now. Yeah, woo, cool. Um, he also has routing. Yeah, he has domains for it. He has um, routing over its app. That's all cool. That's the what the platform about. Um, but what he doesn't have is a database out of the box. And that's not part of Cloud Foundry, to have a database for uh, backing up your app. Um, and there's where service and service brokers comes in. So Cloud Foundry doesn't know how to ship a MySQL database or uh, something else. Um, but you know, what you know is the, the, that marketplace experience. You go to CF Marketplace, you see, oh, there, that are the offerings. Um, I can... Uh, uh, I can create some service there. I can uh, make some uh, a switch between plans, select one, and that's an SSL, uh, SLO I get there. So someone is promoting me. You get here in, uh, in super high um, uh, available database service which mo where you can put your g uh, loads in it. But that's not Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry is only providing you with that information. What in the background Cloud Foundry is doing is talking with a service broker. Um, you even want to have more things for your app. You may want to auto-scale your app. You want to get your logs somewhere centralized. You want to have some th changes in firewalls for your application automated. You want to have maybe a message queue in front. And all that stuff connect to your application. At best, as environment variables stuffed into your application's runtime so you can easily consume these variables in there as environment variables of your application in your runtime container and utilize that to talk to the message queue, talk to the database, and you don't care where it comes from. The, that's part of the, the experience the platform brings to you. So what you have there as a concept is Cloud Foundry with its application and you have some servers of some kind and it's coming from some uh, fantastic services, you don't care where it is. For example, it could be, and it's only an example, Cloud Foundry, as a, you have a web app, and you have OpenStack, and they're running a MySQL, for example. So what's the service broker for in that? Um, this, that's easy. If you're a developer, you go to your Cloud Controller, and you say, create service instance. That's the first arrow here, 
Then Cloudflare in the, in the background calls the service broker. He knows, he has told me that plan. He, he can create me that service. In the background, he's deploying that, creating something for you, making a database, maybe running some SQL scripts in the background, maybe creating new virtual machines or whatever. And then tells cloud, the cloud controller, yeah, I've made that. That's there if you want to use it. Here are the information for your application, do it. And then the application can directly interact with that service instance. So the interaction on the runtime of the application isn't through that service broker. The service broker is some magic um, adapter for your Cloud Foundry platform to get to the services, to the customers, and it doesn't have to care about the specific domain of that service. It doesn't know what that is doing. It's handling its lifecycle management. Um, why is that possible? It's because of the Open Service Broker API. Um, that's a project um, because that concept of having someone doing the stuff to get a service for you, it's not only necessary for Cloud Foundry, it's also necessary for example Kubernetes. And that's why the Open Service Broker API first in the past was created for Cloud Foundry is nowadays also there for Kubernetes. So you can plug that into Kubernetes and then you have the same experience in Kubernetes like you have it in Cloud Foundry. And um, the spec is out there, it's open, you can contribute to it, you can discuss it, raise issues, I need that for, if I'm developing a service broker, I can say I need that feature in the API spec, and it gets done and back to Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes from there, because they're implementing uh, that API. That's the way Cloud Foundry talks with the service broker. It's open source you, um, on that uh, address. Um, so, what is this all about? Um, what type of services could there be? Um, in the concept of the Open Service Broker API, we are, um, have different kinds of services. First of all, we um, divide between managed services and user-provided service instances. Managed services, that's easy. That's the things you get from the service broker. And what's user-provided service instances? Um, there's that call in Cloud Foundry CLI, CF create user-provided service, and you can put therein some JSON. What's that about? Uh, I have some service instance. It's already there. Um, I don't want to make a service broker out for it. Um, but I want to have that feeling of using one service broker. So you can put the credentials to that service instance, that IP address, the username, the password, in that command as in JSON format, and then uh, you, uh, bind that service instance to your app, start it, and it's the same feeling like with the service broker, but for that single instance. And you have done the, the work for the, of the service broker by hand in that. Um, the alternative, um, if you managed with a service broker, um, what are the different kinds of, of services you can have? For example, you have bindable services and you have non-bindable services. Why should I have a differentiation in that? Um, bindable is you can put that on your application. It's something which is um, connected to your application, which can... Um, uh, where you have to, for example, want to have credentials to your database inside of your application's runtime. But at some points you may not want to have, uh, your service may is something more abstract. You are on a space level or something. It's not specific for one application, but it's a thing in general. Um, for example, that could be some uh, stuff about um, you want to ha provide your ca platform customers something like a service offering, a support level. They can book via the Steve Marketplace. It's nothing you can add to your databases, but it is something which creates some stuff in the background through the service broker, maybe um, changes something in the ca account management of your, that customer, and um, it's bookable by the uh, Marketplace. Um, the other things, um, which you um, can have specific types of services are route services, which are not binded to an application, but to a route. So you can say, all the traffic that is going through to my application, I want first to go through that service instance, and that service instance um, uh, is 
um, looking at that stuff and deciding if it's going to put that to your service, uh, to your application instance or not. So, for example, it could be some, um, some security stuff, scanning if there is some injection in the, in the uh, traffic, or it could be some kind of um, load uh, limiting stuff so you can uh, look into it and if it's too much of, of uh, communication going through to your application, it cuts something off. It's all the stuff you want maybe have in that thing. It's more like or less uh, a man in the middle attack for your service. So your service is scanning that, uh, that, that communication without your app knowing. Um, the syslog drain Service is the thing you, ca uh, you have, you know, CF logs maybe. You can get your logs from your application through your CFCLI, um, but you also can say all the logs my application is doing, please send that to that address. And that's the logs syslog drain services are for. And the third uh, uh, big group is volume services and special ones. These are, I want to have an application and that container should have a mounted volume inside. It's an a, non, a persistent disk maybe you want to have there or a bigger disk and you want to use that. It's a special, very special case. Um, in my opinion, uh, if you want to use it, try don't to. Because what you're getting is state in your application container and that's always a bit problematic. Yeah? It's not really to a factor and it gets messy then. So, we talked a lot. What's the life cycle? We talked from the Open Service Broker API. It's that thing you fetch the catalog as with, um, with your uh, create service broker um, call, which is the operator is doing. Um, it goes, uh, you tell there's a URL, and the, behind that URL you find the service broker. It has credentials that are these. Platform, fetch the catalog of that service broker. What are the offerings of that? Then later on, a customer can do a Sieve Marketplace to look up which um, services are offered. And it says, oh, I want to create that service. In the background, the cloud controller says the service broker provision one instance. So we get spun up a MySQL database. Um, later on, it says bind my servers, um, uh, bind that service to my app. So we create a binding. In the background, maybe it's created a user on that database, a password for him, and provides that back to your application. Later on, I say unbind that service, and the service broker may delete that user on that database. So the application, even if someone grabbed the information, the user credentials from that app environment, is not uh, able to uh, access the database anymore with it. And in the uh, last, we say delete that service, because we don't need that database anymore, and the database in the background is deleted by the service broker. And this flow is always the same. That's the open service broker API, the, the flow in the middle. So it's all about uh, REST calls, and it's all about getting the interaction between um, these two. So there are also additional um, uh, optional uh, interaction possibilities with the, b between Cloud Controller and the Service Broker, but the ones I showed are the most important ones. So why the hassle about Service Brokers, and what are the use cases I can do? Um, first of all, um, if you look at database, for example, we could have there an existing service, maybe a database cluster, which is already there, and I want to provision the, in there my service instances. So what I'm doing is I go to my DBMS, I say create me a new database in, your clus in that cluster, um, that's creating a service instance. Um, or I want to maybe, uh, and then the binding would be create me a user on that da database. Um, or Second use case, I, have, uh, I want to have a single database instance which is dedicated for my, cu for my uh, customer, um, which is a single VM I spin up if you cre uh, say create service instance. So in the background, I do something maybe like Bosch, create a uh, VM, spin it up, install uh, my DBMS system on it, and also creating the database in it. And in the second step, when the binding comes, I do the same stuff I did like with the existing cluster, but that's a single instance for my application. That could be something for load tests, integration tests, why I don't want to hassle with the others. Or it could be something with uh, 
uh, with routing, with load balancing, with firewalling or whatever. Um, and the second thing could be then, uh, like I did the existing DBMS cluster, I could also spin that up for one customer with a great instance. So I, instead of spinning up on a VM, I spin up a high availability database cluster um, and get that running. It could all, all the same things could be create service instance. You can all these things hide behind that um, abstraction uh, idea. So create service instance can mean many things. So the big question is, if I'm stuck with that problem, I need a new service in my platform, I want to provide that to the developers, do I have re to re-implement that whole open service broker API stuff? No. Please don't everyone re-implement all that service broker stuff for the life cycle. There are frameworks out there. Please use them because most of the code in your service broker is always the same. There are frameworks for Go, for Java, and other stuff. Use them because they have one benefit. They already implement the service broker API perfectly. Maybe there is a bug in it. Make a pull request. Let it be fixed. Make a, so use it. For example, my company is uh, doing one of, the, one of the Java frameworks for you. If you're interested in contributing, please do that. We are happy for contributors, but it's open source, you can use it. Please do that. So for example, our framework works like that. All the blue stuff, the management of the catalog, the creation of the service instances, the creation of the service bindings, storing information about your service instance in some database in the background, um, talking to OpenStack, Docker, some existing service, Bosch, it's done by the, or Kubernetes, it's done by that framework. Even this stuff here, it's already there. You have to choose what you want to use, but you have, it's there. Um, what you can focus on is what does create a service binding mean for MySQL? And that's the SQL commands. So this creates a database and this creates users in it and deletes it. So you only plug in the minimum amount of energy in creating a new service broker. And what you have to provide is, this, uh, for example, a Bosch release deploying your database cluster or something like that. Yeah, you have to do that, but you don't have to re-implement the Bosch API. So, second, we'll, let's make a jump to another topic, service key management. We talked about app binding, binding it to an app with a user. Um, so, but maybe at some point of time, there is the point I need for debugging or for migration of data I need to direct access to the database at some point. Because it's databases. They're stateful. They're problematic. And I don't want to do that as an operator of the platform doing the service broker. That's stuff the application people should do because they know what they're doing in the database with, the, with their data, what their application does. If they might need to change a, a table, it's not stuff that should be done by the provider of the service broker. It should be done by the people doing the, actually, the actual stuff, the project, which is making the app. So there's service key management. So new problem, I'm a developer. I want to access the service. That's what we did. Now we want to do that. So instead of doing the information about how to access, putting to the user, add to the application, we want to put it to the user. How do we do that? Easy. We exchange two parts of our life cycle. It's instead of create app binding, a bind service, a delete service, we say create service key, cr delete service key. And there is a command in CFCLI where we can look up, where I can look up the data, the credentials to access them. So I can look up I create a service key and look up that key and see what are the, the access data to your um, application. There are two possibilities what you have to do then to migrate your data. 
first attempt, the service broker creates a wonderful way that the data he's providing you are already accessible from your uh, developer side. Because that ap uh, database may never have, a, or never should have a public uh, IP address accessible from the internet. But your developer is coming from the internet maybe. Um, so what you have to do is do some stuff that he can magically access that. So the IP address or the domain name he's get presented in that service key to access the database is already accessible from the internet and if he, uh, when he deletes the service key, that access will also be deleted. So you put that in the service broker. The other attempt is it's all local. You do that. But what you also do is you create a container an app or a task and put that thing, um, use that with CFSSH and make an um, port forwarding through CFSSH which works like you, you used to from SSH. So you make a dash a big, uh, uppercase L and put the port through and then you could access. So that works um, if it isn't disabled by your platform operators. So there are different approaches to that. Or you can say, no, we don't want to do that. Um, so the service broker people have to do the migration stuff. So what you're doing, essentially what I told you is the service broker in the, if you make that public accessible thing, is doing that the uh, CF, uh, the, the, if you say it's create a service key, the a service broker is shifting some public accessibility to that service instance and may, uh, shifts it um, accessible f in the internet, maybe with uh, some proxying or some stuff, um, and later on it removes that. Um, think about what you're doing. You're making your database accessible to the internet, uh, from the internet. Um, or You say there is an air gap, um, so you have to do the jump with a question mark through CFSSH, and the service key information is only another user, so when the service key is deleted, no one has access anymore with that data uh, information to the instance. So, now we can access, interact with our application, we get a service spun up, um, but we heard a lot, of, a lot about um, distributed infrastructures on that conference now. Um, we have platforms with Cloud Foundry installation and Kubernetes installations all over the place. They could be here, they could be 500. Um, we have, um, for example, T-Mobile in the keynote today, they said they have 19 um, regions, so these are different Cloud Foundry installations where you everywhere have a marketplace and you have to uh, handle that. So what you're ending up with is you have a user, different Cloud Foundry installations, they have both private networks and they're both exposed to the internet. The user is living in that internet. And first attempt is you have at each side a service broker which creates its own services. They're not shared, they're not connected, um, so you, um, if you want to have data at both sides, you have to find a way to uh, synchronize that at application level. Second attempt is you have a service broker at each side, so it's accessible locally for your, uh, for your platform, and you have some central service, maybe at some big cloud company like IBM, the Watson stuff, or you have Google Cloud Cache, or some th something else you want to use in your um, on-premise Cloud Foundry installation. Then you have a service broker on your side, accessing that service, um, which is in the in uh, based in the internet or, or in some central um, data center or something. The third approach, the service broker is at that side where the service lives. So all the platforms access this external URL because for Cloud Foundry, the service broker is a URL. It could be in the internet if it, the cloud controller can access it. 
it can talk to that service broker and that manages the public ser available service. And the most problematic part where it gets really messy is distributed internal services. So you have service brokers at each side, they're producing services and they have to sync automatically. The service brokers have to make up that linking. So if I create a service on the right side and I create a service on the left side, so it's magically they're stuck together and there may be a message queue tunneling uh, messages from one side to another. But that's really messy stuff. You have, have to have a very fit team of engineers doing that service broker stuff because um, you have to come up with distrib its distributed services, its distributed state, um, and this has to be uh, spun up for you automatically. That's not easy. Um, be careful when uh, promising that to your users. That's really hard. You can do that, it's possible, but it comes with assumptions from the users. Oh, now our data is always, always aware, uh, available at both sides. Mm, maybe, maybe the latency kicked it off. Um, but there it is getting out of the focus of uh, special applications, uh, from the general view to special applications, so there are many talks at that conference, many other videos. Um, have a look at them. There are several projects um, trying to solve that problems. Um, that's not one-on-one -on -one anymore. So, when I'm doing my service broker, what are the pitfalls? Where can, where can I make uh, problems with? Um, that differences. I try to hide them. But there are different kinds of deployment of my service bro by my service broker. Um, if I want to unify that in one service broker, that service broker gets complicated. Um, so use frameworks. Um, what else? Multi-tenancy. If you deploy a Redis and you want to make it multi-tenancy uh, po uh, possible, happy fun, because you have one password for all of it. All the users, all the connections, it's one password. If you want to have multi-tenancy, you have to spin up another Redis service with another password. You can do that on the same machine, maybe, share that VM, but it has to be another process. Um, so multi-tenancy is a really specific part of that special service um, a part uh, in your framework. So it's, it's really depending on that special service how to do multi-tenancy, and it's really hard for some services to get that. So from the different kinds of offerings I want to do, maybe some are not well suited for all of the services. Um, because multi-tenancy I may have to introduce by a making these two. So I cannot do that in existing clusters. I may not want to share them, but I can maybe spin up new instances per user. So make a new Redis database for each one. Could be possible, and you're fine with it. Um, capacity bounds. Really interesting when you're getting to databases. The big old databases are really good at enforcing capacity bounds. The new databases aren't that often. <laughs> they may are able to say, oh, you can at, le uh, at max do that amount of, of disk space, but you're not able to limit memory for, or CPU. So um, if you uh, share some, uh, some existing cluster, you may have the problem that one user is grabbing all the CPU cycles and the other customer ha having issues with that. Um, so if you do operations for it, you get problems to see, oh, we have that bad customer. We should put him on a personal one, a cluster, and don't put him on, on the existing shared one. Um, session management. There is normally an, a maximum amount of uh, sessions each instance can do, and for some services, um, the, if the, the connection is closed by the client, 
it's not obvious for the service that it is closed, so it keeps the session alive, and it pollutes the amount of, of sessions the service can hold. So you have to have in the background some stuff like killing sessions that aren't used for some time or some stuff. You have to do that. And it's not part of, maybe not part of the service broker, it's not part of the, uh, of the uh, service broker API, but it's part of how you deploy the service. Maybe it's uh, something you have on your Bosch release. Maybe there's a process looking up if I have to kill these old sessions. Um, that's day two operations. Like, also like backup, yeah? And this whole we talked about, we didn't talk about backup, but you have to have that. So you have to maybe implement it, maybe provide that uh, possibility to your users with your service instances. If you look, if you uh, have a service instance, you make CF service, service name, and then you see the information of your service. So that's always the possibility. There are two fields. One is documentation. There you can put an URL where your users can find uh, information about that service, how to use it properly, and there is a uh, field which is shows you um, a dashboard. Use that, because there you can m make a backup management configurable or something uh, like that. So um, these URLs are shipped with a service instance creation um, to, the, uh, to Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes, and then um, they can provide that to the user. So he ca is able to manage that service instance to some point. Um, also problematic, version updates. Because, ha, huh, PostgreSQL has some security issues. I want to switch over to the next version of PostgreSQL, but because there it's fixed. Okay, we deployed that service instance VMs automatically with Bosch, so we now have to manage the update of it. But updating it maybe breaks some of the um, specs of that database. So some functionalities are, were deprecated, aren't available anymore. So that has to be some, some to some point visible to your, uh, to your consumer, to your, the app, application developer. Because he has to know when the switch happens. But you may not have a service broker team have a, back, uh, a communication channel back to your user. Um, so what you have to do uh, what you can do is there's the command update service instance, which the user can do. So there you can maybe provide another plan, which he can update his service instance to. So he switches from his old plan to the new plan with a new major version of PostgreSQL or Maria, MariaDB or whatever. So you can couple that in that part of your uh, service instance lifecycle. Plan changes. You offered something, now you don't want to offer that because it made too much issues. Um, or you want to change what is offered with that service instance, but the service instance is already there. That's a life cycle management you have to come up with. Um, also, what is problematic is what to put in a service and what to put in the service plan. What is part of services? across several plans and what is part of a specific plan. You have to make that decision first. If you want to make a service broker, you have to have a plan what you want to offer. What is a service and what are SLAs? But because SLAs are service plans. Do I want to have existing clusters, single services for tests, instance for test, do I want to have specific clusters for something? What do I do? What, what is the service at its core? It could also be an email send it out to operations who do some stuff. Yeah, that could also be the service. Create a ticket at some backlog. Whatever. Um, have in mind first what you want to achieve, then start with the service broker. Um, also, monitoring of the automatically created stuff, yeah? You have to plug that into some monitoring. Also for maybe for the customers. Um, configuration management. Um, you may want to re change configurations of that existing s stuff, so you have to have a plan for that. I'm only talking about this stuff because service brokers aren't that simple. On the first end, you have that simple API you have only to implement um, but 
Why are we doing service brokers? It's because the stuff we didn't put in Cloud Foundry is the stuff that gets really hard to maintain. State is hard to maintain. Um, so we're putting that out of Cloud Foundry. So we have to make up plans how to maintain that outside in that service teams. Um, and part of it you can put in the service broker, parts you can't, but you have to make your decisions about it to be clear what you want to achieve with that service broker first and then do it. Often what happens, management comes to a product team, we need a service in our marketplace, do that. Please do that. Come up with a plan for it. Implement it, ship it to us, and do it. And then the, the, the guy is here, okay, what's the service broker? Okay, I understand that API, I implemented it. Oh, I made a bug with the implementation. Oh, customers complaining that they get wrong errors from Cloud Foundry with some mysterious messages that the service broker didn't work like Cloud Foundry expected. Okay, now, now I'm using the framework. Now it should work. Oh, day two is hard. Ah. Don't do that. Make the plans first. Get people to know how to run that service, how to manage it, and then ask them how to automate that processes and then put that in the service broker. Make plans first, then do the service broker. And don't forget tests. There are contract testers um, out there for testing that your service broker implemented the specifications. My company has one. We're talking nowadays to make that officially. Maybe that link changes to uh, officially one of the Open Service Broker API in the next days. We're talking about how to do that best or if we want to manage a list of available service brokers that are actual and maintained on the Open Service Brokers APIs list uh, page. Um, look out for these. There are several at the moment. Um, we're checking if we focus on one or doing different. Um, if that changes, that we will push the code uh, maintenance on Open Service Broker, um, we will put a link on that address so we can find the new version. Um, these are contract tests. They only show that you keep the lifecycle correct, so that Cloud Foundry correctly can communicate with your service broker. That doesn't do smoke test with your service broker, uh, services. That doesn't know if the service you provided, you created, is up and running after the, uh, it made the create instance and the service broker said, yeah, I'm done. Do these tests also and do it in CICD. You're creating a product here. Test it. Make lifecycle tests. It's like you're doing an app. If you provide a database here, a database creation automation, you have to want to have test for it, like you want to have it for your application. So that could be, for, for example, a CSCD pipeline, making the contract tests with a service broker, then making another set of scenario tests where you create an instance and then have another app deployed which tries to connect to that service instance. And if it fails, you have done something wrong, and if it, it's good, you know that at least this application deployed to Cloud Foundry in a test environment is able to access your service. So if there are other customers say, we can't access that, it doesn't work for us, you can say, my app does? Let's talk about the differences. What do you do other than me? So last but not least, you know that 12 factor applications, the, the apps you're deploying to Cloud Foundry, that's fun. Your service broker can also be a 12 factor application but your databases may not. <laughs> Think about that. What we're doing with the service broker is we are making fro up from a software as a service perspective down in the stack um, to maybe infrastructure as a service or hardware as a service or something, yeah? We are doing a debtor uh, here. So please be careful with it. Have you make up your minds before doing it and doing it correctly in the first place. Because if you are providing a service and customers think it's not working, they're customers. They go somewhere else, they complain. You want them on your side, you want to make them happy. So think about that. Think about user experience when you create a service broker. 
So that's us. You can reach out to us if you have questions. Like I said, Ambassador, happy to answer your questions about Cloud Foundry and especially service brokers and services. Um, yeah, if there are any questions, come out with them. Otherwise, I'm out there and I'm available on the conference like uh, here, uh, when I'm here. Thank you. <laughs>